Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. And um, I am Pastor Janice Minsky, here with my husband, Pastor Michael Ozzy Esminski from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, located on Topher and Warren, Topher and Shaner and Warren. Um, hopefully when COVID's finally gone, we'll be back together, and some of you that have been watching us online can come and visit us. We'd like to meet you in person. So today I'm going to open up in Psalm 3 with a prayer. Uh, Psalm 3 is going to be our prayer, and then I'm going to go on from there. So if you want to open your Bibles to Psalm 3, make sure you have something ready for communion, um, something to drink and something to eat. That would be great. Psalm 3, a Psalm of David when he had fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. So many times we feel that way, don't we? Many are they who rise up against me. Sometimes we feel like our foes are larger, the amounts are larger than our, our friends. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And I think we hear that many times in different situations. Your problem is too big for God. Or what you did, God will never help you. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. You know, I thought that last Friday, the one who lifts up my head, sometimes we get downcast and our heads are down. Some people suffer from depression and their heads are down. But God says he wants to lift you up. He wants to lift that chin up and look and look to the sky. Look to him. Look for help. Don't look down. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. Now, this one's very interesting. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. You know, when you think about it, when you're sleeping, you're most vulnerable. You're sleeping. You have no protection. Anybody could attack you and hurt you. And that's what I think David was referring to. You know, Absalom's men could have rushed in while he was asleep and killed him. But God took care of him. He trusted in God to get rest. And Dave needed, David needed rest. He needed it so badly. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have all set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Well, today is what we would call Palm Sunday. Actually, it is the celebration of Passover. Um... And uh, as, you know, if you were a Catholic, I, I was, we would get a palm this day when we would go to church. And the palm represents um, honoring God, you know, and we'll go into the story right now. So if you want to turn to Matthew, um, Matthew 21. And I'm going to start reading, and I'm going to stop and and comment. The thing is, though, I really want you to think about who are you in the crowd? Who do you represent on Palm Sunday? Now, when they drew near Jerusalem, verse 1, and came to Pethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village, opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her loose them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you you shall say the lord has needed them and immediately he will send them what i think is interesting is that jesus had his disciples you know announce who wanted them to say the lord needs them and the lord was confident that the person would allow the donkey in the in the cult to be taken. But Jesus didn't do it without asking, basically. He was respectful of those people that owned those um, animals. All this was done, then it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a cult, the fowl of a donkey. 
And so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Now, for years ago, I used to think that the donkey represented um, that, you know, he wasn't worthy to be a king. The king's got the horses. But actually, donkeys represent um, after the king won a battle, he would return back to the city riding on a donkey that showed victory. It represented peace. He was coming in peace. He was walking slowly, not fast. It, 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 it symbolizes that Jesus is our king and he is going to fight for us. He's going to continue to stand for us. But Jesus' nature isn't um, ruthless. It isn't malice. It isn't, it, he's, he's peaceful. He's a God of love and mercy. And all that is represented with that donkey riding in, in, in down the road in the capital. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the people are worshiping him. Now, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, Jesus came into town in a very public way. He didn't sneak in through the back door. He made it very public he was coming. And um, his representation, we need to always remain, remember this. Jesus comes in humility, not pride. Jesus comes in uh, poverty over affluence. Jesus comes in meekness and gentleness over rage and malice. So he's symbolizing so much. People are praising him. He's he's surrounded by praise by the common people. Uh, and, and the question is, why were they there? Well, first of all, it was Passover. So it was wall-to-wall -wall people. It was a huge celebration. It, it, I don't know what we could equate it to in, in, in our times now, but it was huge and everybody was there. And and they were all shouting for him. Not all, but a lot of them were worshiping him out loud, worshiping him. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They believed he was their king. He was their Messiah. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, I want to mention this happened... Um, uh, Jesus had uh, brought Lazarus back from the dead. And a lot of people heard about it. A lot of people have heard about all his uh, miracles. So a lot of people came for that. They heard he was this great healer. They maybe didn't even care about his integrity, didn't care about his humility, didn't care. They just saw an opportunity to ride on his coattails, to follow a man. Uh, maybe they would do an offshoot of the ministry of Jesus. Maybe they would um, they would have a little uh, church and Jesus could come and speak and they, and they could get money. You don't know what all the motives of the people were that came that day. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees were there. And they weren't there as a fan of Jesus. But I want you to picture, you know, whenever I thought of Palm Sunday, I just thought of this little road, Jesus on a donkey, going down, people, you know, with palms, waving at them. But it was packed. It was it was the capital. It's like us going to Washington, D.C. And Jesus coming to Washington, D.C. And all the people would be crowding on buildings everywhere, calling out to him, Hosanna in the highest. Little, little, and it, wait, it's a, let me back up. It's little, it's interesting to me that five days, I think it's five days later, they would all change their minds. They would not be worshiping him. They would be condemning him. They'd be saying, crucify him, crucify him. What happened in five days to change their hearts? You know, do we ever, do we ever get in a place where we just think, oh, God is on the throne, hallelujah, Hosanna in the highest. And then 
the penny drops and then something happens and we're just, we're so confused. And we walk away from God. We might not do what they did and go up to uh, Pontius Pilate and say, crucify him, but in our hearts, we've deserted. See, why are we, why are we along the road worshiping? Why did we come to see him? And think about this. If he was the greatest person on the face of the earth that at that time, but we know there were others that were mimicking him, being healers and all that. But if you heard he was coming, we'd probably all want to get there. We'd all want to rush there. It's like going to your, um, hearing your favorite musician is going to have a concert. You get the tickets the first day. But you know what? Some of the people that went there didn't have pure hearts. They didn't have pure hearts. And even the ones that thought they had pure hearts didn't. Because when everything went south, when Jesus was arrested, and he was, oh my gosh, what he went through, he was, um, he was, uh, oh, I wrote down, it was just so awful. Of course, I don't know where I wrote it down, but he um, was scourged, and he was mocked, and he was beaten, and he was, and then eventually killed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were thinking, um, he was your king? And so they, they just, they all deserted him. They deserted him at that last time. Do we desert God? Do we desert God? When things don't go how we think they should go, do we just desert him? I know I have. Now, fortunately, I've come back. <laughs> But there were times when it was so heartbreaking for me. I just, I went in my room, shut my door and, and just stayed there for a while. You ask yourself, have you been the one that walked away? That you were praising him on the roadside with all the other people, big celebration. And then when he died and was crucified, when he died in your dreams, when he was crucified in your plan, did you desert him? So, I have been thinking a lot lately that this is a very crucial hour. The church has failed miserably, but God's giving us a second chance. He wants us to be worshipers for sure. And I wish I could sing, but I can't. But that's not the only way I need to worship. I will sing, as bad as it may be. But I will do other things, and I'm going to take um, opportunities, seriously, to worship God. And, and, and I just want to say there are people in our church that you don't even know they're there. They work without a name. They don't brag about what they do. They just do it, and it is amazing, and it's to the glory of God that they're doing it, and they're helping our church stay afloat. Thank you, guys. You know who you are. There's opportunities at our church all the time for help. There's opportunities in your neighborhood. There's opportunities at the grocery store. There's opportunities everywhere. You know, maybe you have a sickly neighbor, and, you know, she can't do anything. Maybe you're at the grocery store, and a little old lady can't even... Lift the bags to put in your car. See, we have to be the hands of Jesus. We have to reach out. And we have to start thinking outside of the box. These are the only ways I can do things. It's the only way I show God I love him. No, 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 no. You have to stop. You have to stop. Everybody, everybody has a job. Everybody is needed in the body of Christ. It is not just the pastor. It's not just a team of people praying. It is everybody. If everybody does their part, if everybody did their part. So today on Palm Sunday, you know, the story is incredible. You can read it in Matthew 21. You can read it in Luke. You can read it in John. Um, and there's also little, little gems that add to the story. You know, right before Jesus went, um, well, he was staying at Mary and Martha's house and they anointed him with oil and they and, and, and they washed his feet and anointed his feet with oil and then dried his feet with their hair. And, you know, Judas is standing there saying, what a waste. It wasn't a waste. The whole house was filled with the smell of worship. We can't let that voice say to us, what a waste. 
Your time is not a waste. Your love is not a waste. So who are you on Palm Sunday? Who were you? Did you just follow him because you knew he could heal you? Did you just follow him because you thought you could make a name for yourself in your ministry? Who were you that day? Or were you really loving him? And did you really say, I'm going to go the distance with you, Jesus. I'm going to go. My name doesn't have to be on anything. It's just your name that matters. So I'm going to stop there because there's, there's, you know, there's so much more in this story. And I challenge you to read those, those stories and kind of piece them together and decide, you know, and get a full picture of what was really going on. A full picture. See, we live in a, a world where it's just snapshots and we piece them together. This is a whole movie. It, it has so much in it. Just this one day has so much in it. You can go on and see what Jesus did after he journeyed down the road. He went into the temple. And what did he, I mean, it was, it's just so packed full of things. But the most important thing is for us to look at him as the author and finisher of our lives. And, 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 and to start thinking outside of the box. And start thinking his name first. My name doesn't even have to appear. His name. And isn't it interesting, all the things Jesus did, and he would say, you know, he'd heal someone, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. And they knew after a while it was useless to even say that because the word was out. But if Jesus, our God, said, don't tell people what I'm doing, why do we want to tell everybody what we're doing? Why? So I just want to conclude. I want us to get our elements for communion. I just want this to be a new day. I want us to start feeling alive and feeling like we can do all things through Christ, that we can think outside of the box and start doing whatever um, we are called to do. Everybody has, has a journey. And mine might not be exactly like yours, but I'm still on the path with you. You might be picking the flowers to give a sick woman I might be, um, I don't know what I would be doing, uh, maybe um, hanging from a tree, swinging from tree to tree. I don't know, but anyway, that's dumb. But anyway, you know what? We're all on the same path. We're just, we're journeying together and we need to remember that. So communion time and um, on Palm Sunday, thinking of Jesus going down that road Mobs of people, mobs of people worshiping him, mobs and mobs. But where were they five days later? Mobs of people worshiping him. And he was humble. He didn't get out and start dancing. He just was humble, riding that mule. So Lord, may we remember always to be like you, to feel you within us, to know, Lord, that it is greater to be meek than it is to be proud. Lord, help us to not want to have our names in lights. Lord, help us to just be a servant as you were a servant. May we look to you as our example always, dear Jesus. And thank you so much for dying for us, for taking this journey. Next Sunday will be your resurrection Sunday. We will be, we will be worshiping you for the endurance of the pain on the cross in your ultimate resurrection. Thank you, God, for suffering and loving us. Amen. And Lord, I don't know how you felt all the time, but you know, there was always someone out to kill you, always someone out to destroy your life. But you had confidence that it would only happen when the Father said it would happen. Lord, we just ask that we would have that confidence too. We would not be fearful, but we would trust in you, and know that our lives are in your hands. We thank you, dear Jesus, for your precious blood, Lord, and for your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't want to forget today that we have Sunday school for the children. I forgot last week. So there is uh, online 
Uh, I think all the children know that. If, if you're new and you're a guest and you want to jump on and um, you go to um, lhcfwarn.com Sunday, slash Sunday School. So we welcome you. We have some really amazing teachers that are just giving it all and um, they're thinking outside of the box and they're working very hard to make it make your children a part of our ministry. So thank you all. God bless. Good morning. I want to do a special shout out to Apostle Reggie Holiday um, for several reasons. You know, I woke up this morning, went to bed last night, a dead man. And what I mean by that is where we're at in the church right now. I mean, there are, I spend moments of great discouragement, uh, hours of discouragement, powerlessness, despair, frustration, followed by the Lord coming in raising me up, hours of rejoicing, walking in confidence, declaring the word of the Lord, doing the work of the Lord, followed followed by, again, despair. And it is a, it's a constant process. I personally, I believe that most Christians are feeling this way, should be feeling this way whether you're a Christian who's seeing things clearly, not seeing things clearly, confused, very confident that you're hearing the Lord, deceived, uh, some of you just doing the work of the Lord and, and not thinking too much about anything else. We all should really have those moments of lament. There is much to lament right now. So I woke up dead, a dead man, and starting with um, our Sunday morning uh, prayer, Pastor Br Brian Johnson from uh, Apostle Reggie Holiday's group of churches, his prayer brought me back to life, raised me from the dead. And then I was studying the Word, and, and uh, Apostle Reggie Holiday sent me a uh, a video, a YouTube video, and it was Todd Delaney, and he was doing what I believe was a spontaneous song, and he was singing. He just opened up and began to sing Psalm 18, just as Allison did this morning uh, from our congregation. And then that, I was raised from the dead by Pastor Johnson's prayer, and I was uh, cleansed and healed and delivered and encouraged by that worship song. So here we are. Uh, we have, we actually uh, concluded last week the Psalms again. That was our, our third time through Psalms 90 through 150. We've been through Psalms 1 through 89 twice. And uh, I uh, taught on some things on Wednesday at the Wednesday Bible study. And I'd like to pick up uh, a little bit of that and and maybe move forward as we're coming to the end of the Psalter if we go to Psalm 138 we see David again now the first two books of the Psalms were dominated by David Psalms in fact the majority of the first two books book one is uh, uh let me see if I, I wrote the numbers down here. Book 1, 38 of 41 Psalms attributed to David. Book 2, 18 of 31 Psalms attributed to David. But we get to book 3 and the prophets take over because um, book 3 corresponds with the exile or uh, with the divided kingdom that led to the exile when Israel and Judah separated from each other became separate nations the prophets take over in book three and david only has one psalm in book three psalm 86 but guess what that psalm's about the steadfast love and the faithfulness of the lord the revelation of who the lord truly uh was is and was to moses in exodus chapter 34 
one psalm and book three. And of course, we know at the end of book three, Psalm 89 says the kingship's over. It's done because the exile begins. And there, as we've said a number of times, there would no longer be any kings in Israel after that. Book four, you have three psalms attributed to David, 101, 102, 103. And now David goes from this, the king, the mighty man of God, to one who sees himself as poor and needy, one who sees himself as afflicted. And again, one of those, uh, actually, um, two of those Psalms, 101 and 103, mention again the steadfast love of the Lord and the faithfulness of the Lord. David makes a return uh, on several uh, Psalms in Book 5, and his final appearance is Psalms 138 through 145, which many believe actually conclude the Psalms. The Psalms can end with 145, and then the final five Psalms, 146 through 150, are the Hallelujah Psalms, the Praise the Lord Psalms, uh, that conclude the, the Psalter with worship. The Psalter begins with obedience. Psalm 1 is the contrast of the righteous and the wicked, but it ends in Psalms 146 through 150, praise and worship. So we move from um, obedience to worshipful, celebratory obedience because of the kingship of the Lord. And we know, of course, David doesn't need to be the king anymore because the Lord is the king. And in book four, Psalms 93 through 100, speak of the establishment of the kingship of the Lord in the earth. And that's why book five is full of psalms of worship and celebration and praise and thanksgiving. If we start out in 138, these final eight psalms here, 138 through 145, are all attributed to David. And they kind of give us a final image, a final picture of the movement toward what happens when the kingship of the Lord is established in the earth. And Psalm, Psalms 146 through 150 say, the whole earth rejoices. The heavens rejoice, the earth rejoices, Israel rejoices, the nations rejoice, all rejoice. And so the conclusion of God's eschatological plan, the purpose that the Lord has for his creation is that all of his creation ends up worshiping him. And of course, we see that picture unfold in the book of Revelation as well. The book of Revelation concludes with the spirit and the bride just worshiping and the Spirit and the Bride leading the nations of the earth to worship the Lord. So Psalm 138 reads this way. In Psalm 138 and 145, there's a real parallel between them. They just speak of, of this, this pattern that the Psalms are leading us toward as the people of God. David says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And all these, this different terminology to worship the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, bowing down before the Lord, singing praise, praising, worshiping, and thanking his name, thanking his name because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And we've talked all along, steadfast love and faithfulness is the old covenant counterpart to grace and truth. We beheld his glory, John chapter one, the glory of the word, the glory of the Lord Jesus, the glory of the Messiah, the glory of the one who makes the triumphal entry today is crucified later this week, but will be raised from the dead next week. And we beheld his glory full of grace and truth, full of steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Now, this is important to understand it's the name of the Lord and the word of the Lord that are being exalted. The name is who he is. And we know from Psalm 118, and Psalm 118 is the psalm that is quoted in Matthew 21. It's the psalm that it speaks of Jesus' triumphal entry. We know that um, 22 times God is called Yahweh in that psalm, but six times he's called Yah. And we talked about that several weeks ago. Yah is the hidden name of the Lord. 
for you have exalted above all things your name, who you ultimately and really are, and your word. Now, this isn't the normal Hebrew term for word. That's davar. Davar can be a written word. Davar can be a spoken word. Davar can even be a thing that takes place that reveals who God is, a thing, a matter, uh, is, is actually a word. See, God's word, he, he has his written word through which he speaks to us. He has his spoken word. He speaks to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. He speaks to us prophetically. He speaks to us when uh, the word is proclaimed by by. Uh, ministers of the word, but he speaks to us through circumstances too. And Devar covers that. Circumstances are words. Circumstances are part of the divine kingdom story that the Lord is revealing to us along with his Holy Spirit, along with his word, along with leadership, teaching and proclaiming the word. This Hebrew term for word is Imra. It's not Devar. And Imra is a spoken promise. In fact, it would probably be better um, to be translated your promised word. So what the Lord has exalted above all things is his name, who he is, and his promises. His name, he's the God of steadfast love. His faithfulness, those are his promises. He is faithful to fulfill his word, and he's exalted these things. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. You, you actually, uh, let me, let me uh, look this up um, in the Hebrew here. Um, he said, on the day that I called, you answered me, and you made my soul bold. You inspired my soul. You encouraged my soul. So there's prayer here along with worship. And then because of his testimony, he bears witness as the church, as the people of God bear witness to the Lord in praise and worship and intercession and in declaring his faithfulness and the thing that he's promised, all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord for they have heard the words of your mouth. See, the nations now, they see the Lord. And see, this is the responsibility of the church. It's to, uh, to cause the nations to see who the Lord is. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. See, the nations of the earth join into the praise and the worship and the thanksgiving. For... Though the Lord is on high, he regards the lowly. And you see, particularly in book five, particularly in these final 13 Psalms, 138 through 150, there's this theology of the poor, that the Lord always is there to deliver the vulnerable, to deliver the poor, to deliver the oppressed, to deliver the afflicted. He's always there to do that. What is happening though now, it, there's this transformation of, 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 of prophetic concepts, this increase of prophetic imagination. God's people begin to see as he sees. The whole nation of Israel herself becomes the poor because they're persecuted by all the nations of the earth. Remember, book five is the return from exile. Book three the divided kingdom, which leads to book four, the exile, but it's in the exile that the kingship of the Lord is established when he brings his people back from exile. And then book five, it's the restoration after the exile. And now Israel, Israel herself is the lowly. Just as David goes from being the mighty king to being the poor and needy one in books three, and then in books four and five, he doesn't even address his kingship in his psalms. He just addresses the fact that he's poor and needy and afflicted. And see, all the people of God become the poor, the needy, the afflicted, whom the Lord establishes his kingdom in the earth. And that's what's powerful. For the Lord for though he is high, he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. 
when we examine the church in America right now, is it a proud, arrogant, angry, violent, let's, let's get all the enemies who are stealing our way of life, God, get them? Or are we a church of the poor and the lowly and the needy and the afflicted who cry out to our God in praise and thanksgiving for the Lord to deliver us and establish his kingdom. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my enemies. Your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Again, your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Now, the work of your hands is something very important at this point in the Psalms. We've seen it, that phrase repeatedly in books four and five, that the Lord will establish the works of his hands that he will not forsake. First of all, that speaks of creation, the original creation, Genesis chapter one, God is a creator God. That's the work of his hands. The second aspect, of the work of his hands is that the Lord delivers his people from Egypt. He delivers his enslaved, oppressed people from the bondage of human empires and human political structures. And then the third work of his hand is that those very people that were delivered from Egypt, brought into the land, given an inheritance by the Lord, promoted, exalted, blessed by the delivering hand of the Lord, yet turn on the Lord, he sends them in exile, but the third work of his hand is that he brings them back from exile. He's the God of not just the first chance, but the God of the second chance. And so this underlying theme of creation, deliverance from our enemies, and return from exile. God creates and recreates through Jesus, always. God delivers his people from oppression, but God also delivers his disobedient people who stumble in the exile because they have not worshipped him and they've, they've placed false gods above him. The Lord still brings them out. Psalm 139 is the famous prayer of David. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. And David goes on and just talks about this incredible, incredible relationship with the God who's created him and knows him and understands him and has set out life purpose for him. So we move from this praising of the Lord to an intimate relationship with God through prayer. And then the next four Psalms are interesting. Psalm 140, 141, 142, and 143 are all Psalms of lament. And they deal with David's pain, the pain that David experienced through all the spiritual warfare, through all the attacks of the enemies, through all the oppression. Look at the just some of the words in Psalm 140, verse 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongues sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps, Selah. And David just cries out to be delivered. And, and these verses just enumerate different horrific imagery of the pain that David has experienced because of his enemies. But verse 12 says, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name and the upright shall dwell in your presence in spite of violence, in spite of attacks, in spite of war, in spite of oppression, in spite of traps. The Lord maintains the cause of those who, again, are the afflicted ones, the needy ones. The afflicted and the needy ones become the righteous who give thanks to, again, that name who delivers God's people and those who fear him will dwell in his presence. 141, more lament. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. 
Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. See, prayer here is is equated with incense. And we know that from the book of Revelation. We're always saying, let the intercession, the prayer of the saints go to heaven and tip the bowls of the incense that they come back down on the earth and cause the the purposes of the Lord to be accomplished. But here's, here's an interesting point. The Jewish understanding of incense, and this, remember, there was an altar of incense and morning and evening, the incense was was lit before the Lord and a sweet-smelling savor went up before him. The Jews taught that incense was God's solution, God's answer for slander. That when, when God's people were lied to, when God's people were lied about, when God's people were sought to be brought into bondage through lies, you counter that with incense, intercessory prayer. Now we understand what is the the dynamic equivalent of slander in this hour. False prophecy is slander because it's slandering God. It's slandering the people of God. It slanders God to God's people, God's people to God, and it slanders God's people against each other. The answer is prayer. In an hour where false prophecy increases, intercessory prayer needs to increase to counter slander. Intercessory prayer can break the power of false prophecy. That is just just going through the body of Christ like like unstoppable wildfire in California. Notice what it says. Set a guard, verse 3, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds, in company with men who work iniquity. Do not let me eat of their delicacies. Do you understand that when false prophecy and slander come from powerful people, the temptation for us is to fall right into that slander and the slander back, to attack, to become like them. And it's called, don't let me feast on their delicacies. You know, there's this this kind of awesome release of power when you diss somebody when you accuse somebody, when you lash out at somebody, when you attack somebody. Hey, Facebook, the spirit of let's go after each other. Well, brethren, David says here, don't let me get into that. And how do I stop from getting into that? I pray, I pray, I pray. These psalms are becoming more messianic too. Uh, David's psalms in book five are, are, are very messianic. They're pointing beyond himself to a future son, the Lord Jesus. We know that Psalm 110, uh, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament is Psalm 110. And in, it was in the very week after Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You see it, I believe, Matthew 22. The scribes and Pharisees come and everybody's questioning Jesus. The Messiah's come on hit the colt and the foal of the donkey and the Hosanna, save, O King, Hosanna to the son of David. He's come in. It is, it's, this is a, a, a Psalm Sunday week Psalm, Psalm 110. And they say, how can, how, how is it, you know, that uh, uh, David calls his son, his Lord, which Psalm 110 does. So we, we, we see this increasingly messianic dimension here. Now, Psalm 141 says, set a guard over my lips. Set a guard over my lips. You know, in Psalm 140, which led to Psalm 141, I, I skipped this verse. Look what Look what verse 11 says in Psalm 140. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. 
let evil hunt down the violent man speedily, the slanderous, violent man that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and execute justice for the needy against. This Psalm 141, it's messianic. Remember when Jesus was being attacked like crazy by the Sanhedrin before he died? What did Jesus do? He did what I just did. He kept silent. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. See, see, when we're being slandered, we don't need to get on Facebook and slander back. When we're being told we're deceived, we're useful idiots and all these things, when we're being told those things, you know what? Some of the best, the best behavior is at those times, it's to be silent. Just like Jesus. Don't get caught up in that spirit of false prophecy. It wants you to lash out at people. It wants you to act in anger. It wants you to justify yourself and your views. Don't go there. Verse 8 of 141, But my eyes are toward you, O God my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of the evildoers. Let the wicked fall in their own nets while I pass by safely. We go into Psalm 142. It's a maskil, again, a, a wisdom song, a song that teaches wisdom of David. And this is the only one of these final eight where a historical description is uh, rendered in the um, heading. This is when he was in the cave, and it's a prayer. And the cave that he's in, you see at in verse uh, maybe 5, we'll look at verse 5 of Psalm 142, I cry to you, O Lord, I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, they're too strong for me. Bring me out of prison. The caves that sometimes our enemies force us into are, are, are like prisons, spiritual prisons, prisons of oppression, prin, prin, prisons of bondage, prisons of, of just being caught up in our own thoughts. And David says, bring me out of the prison that I may give thanks to your name. How do we get out of the prisons we're in? The righteous will surround me and you will deal bountifully with me. You will gather your righteous ones around me and you will deal mightily, powerfully, blessedly for me. Psalm 143 continues and it's the fourth Psalm of Lament. Now, why in the midst of a book? Remember we said, the majority of David's psalms in books one and two, they're psalms of lament. The prophets take up lament in book three. Book four, we start seeing a turning because we see Moses begins to intercede in prayer. Prayer turns our psalms of lament, our prophecies of doom into worship, into celebration, into glory and into life. So how, how is it and why is it that in this book five that's just, it's all about worship and praise and uh, Passover halal and, and the great halal and the final halal, all these series of psalms of rejoicing. Well, this is important. And what it says is even in the midst of our worship, our rejoicing, our celebration, we must remember our pain. We must remember our suffering. It is Remembered pain is an aspect of who God is. Remembered pain is about, yes, there's death, but remembered pain also causes us to build memorials to the God who raises us from the dead. But we don't forget the times of pain that pressed us into the Lord, that pressed us into wisdom, 
that pressed us into his righteousness, that caused us to see him who he really is, the God who never deserts us. So this is why in the midst of all this incredible praise, and we've had nothing but praise, Psalm 135 and 136 are the, are the, the great halal. Psalms 146 through 150, the final halal. We're going to see praise. We already saw praise in Psalm 138. We're going to see praise in Psalm 144 and 145. But in the midst of this, remembered pain, remembered lament. Not only does it remind us of who the Lord is, but you know what gives me a heart of mercy for my enemies? My own pain. When I, when I, when God allows me to deal with the pain that is in this world, in this universe, the pain that we suffer that has been inflicted upon us, that we inflict on others, and we see a God who stands for healing and restoration and blessing, then we can begin to look even at our enemies and understand that much of what our enemies do is driven by pain. It's driven by fear. It's driven by powerless, the same pain, fear, powerlessness, hopelessness that afflicted us. And there is mercy in our heart for our enemies. And see, it brings us to the right conclusion of the Psalms. The proper conclusion of the Psalms is Psalm 149. What does the Lord do with his enemies? Well, we'll see that in a moment. But in 143... David concludes his his lament with his fourth consecutive lament. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. See, there's the point of remembered pain. What we all realize, what we all realize in some of our darkest, most difficult, most painful hours is that No one living is righteous before you, Lord. It's all on you and it's all up to you. The enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you've done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you in a parched land. Selah. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, let, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning, and here it is over and over again, let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. For in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go. For to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me to level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, You will cut off my enemies and will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. I am your servant. See, David is the poor and the needy one. David becomes the servant of the Lord. And then we come to the 144th Psalm. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. We're going to be back to praise and worship. Who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. And see, it's okay for King David to start to see himself not as the great and the mighty and the powerful, wonderful king, not as the superman or the super apostle, but to see himself as he really is. Because to see the Lord as he really is 
we will see ourselves as we really are, and the two contribute to each other. Bow your heavens, O Lord. Come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. We, I want a theophany. We want to see you like in Revelation 1. We want to see you like in Exodus 19. We want to see you like in Exodus chapter 3. We want to see you, Lord. We want to see you as you, you, you revealed yourself as Yahweh. As Second Isaiah says from Isaiah 40 through 66, when you returned the exiles from exile back to their land, back to their inheritance, you said, then they shall know that I am Yahweh. Then they will know, my people will know that I'm Yahweh. My people will understand. The nations will know that I'm Yahweh. They'll know that I'm the God who makes things happen. Come, Lord, appear. Let us see the works of your hand in creation and recreation and deliverance from our enemies and restoration from exile. Verse 6 again, flash forth lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from many waters, from the hand of foreign foes whose mouths speak lies and whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O Lord, and the new song. We see it in 144. We see it again in 149. The new song is God doing something powerful and mighty. Recreation, deliverance from Egypt, return from exile. God doing this powerful, wonderful, creative work for his people, for the nations of the earth to see as well. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-string harp I will play to you. You who give victory to kings. It's not kings get the victory because they're mighty warriors. You give victory to kings. Who rescues David, and again, just as in the previous psalm, who rescues David, his servant, from the cruel sword. Now you got to stop there. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the psalms from Hebrew into Greek, there are different kinds of inscriptions, headings, superscriptions to the Psalms. You know, there are a number of Psalms in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text that our Old Testament is based on that have no inscription. In the, in the Greek translation, all the Psalms have inscriptions. They add inscriptions where there were no inscriptions. And then some that have inscriptions, they add to the wording. Now, what you understand from that is the translators of the Greek Old Testament, 250 BC, the translators of the scriptures from Hebrew to Greek were aware of a tradition in the Psalter, a tradition behind some of the Psalms that are not given inscriptions, and they included them. This is very important. You know what the inscription in Psalm 144 says? It says, of David concerning Goliath. That this psalm is a psalm that goes back to celebrate 1 Samuel 17 when David destroyed Goliath. It says, and I repeat in verse 10, we, we sing a new song to you, O God, verse 9, who gives victory to kings, who rescues David, his servant, from the sword of violence. The sword of violence, the rabbis taught, was Goliath's sword. And you remember, Goliath said, am I a dog? This, this incredible warrior, never been defeated. He was the ultimate warrior of that day. Uh, never been defeated. Maybe for Rob, he was, you know, Ric Flair of that day. Uh, Goliath says, and you're sending to me this, this puny kid out? What am I, a dog? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy you and I'm going to feed your corpse to the birds of the air. And of course, we know the story. Down goes Goliath. And what did David do? David took Goliath's own sword, the sword of violence, and beheaded him with it. Now, I want, I'm going to read a comment. This is from my, uh, this is a comment on uh, summarizing Psalm 143, or Psalm 144, excuse me, that we're on from a Jewish perspective. 
This is what the rabbis say about this. David composed this psalm of thanksgiving and praise at the beginning of his reign after God granted him victory over his enemies. According to the Midrash, David's remarkable victory over the giant Goliath inspired this psalm. Now see, the rabbis teach that, and the translators of this psalm in the Greek were aware of that teaching, and that's why they added to the inscription of the psalm. But watch what this says, and this fits so well with what we're understanding, how David moves from this mighty king, mighty warrior, to this humble servant of the Lord who declares, I'm poor, I'm needy, I don't get the victory over my enemies. You and you alone get the victory over my enemies. The rabbis continue commenting on this psalm. Many nations become obsessed with their military success and develop a martial literature to laud their accomplishments in war. They praise their accomplishments in war of their great mighty heroes. Countless poets have composed stirring hymns to recount the bravery and the prowess of their military heroes. In this psalm, David expresses the authentic Jewish attitude towards war and warriors. The triumphant soldier has no claim to success, for he is no more than a tool in God's hands. I like how our young people, ah, oh, that guy's just a tool. Well, they might have something biblical there. The triumphant soldier has no claim to success, for he's no more than a tool in God's hands. It is God who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war, verse 1 stated. It is the Almighty who defeats each enemy thrust and shields his people from all the dangerous blows of the foreign warriors. Glory and fame are not for David because it is God who grants salvation to kings, verse 10. Indeed, feats of battle are not to be glorified but shunned, for David views the bloody sword as an evil sword, as a sword of violence. The sword is needed to combat hostile powers, yet it should be deplored. You know, when we as parents, when, when I was raised, uh, when I was raising my adult children as young children, I deplored disciplining them. I hated disciplining them. I disliked it. That's the issue that we need to have. That's the impulse in our hearts when we face our enemies and face our foes. And if we really move into a new covenant understanding of dealing with our enemies and our foes, we recognize, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, we war not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Workers, cosmic workers of, of cosmic realities of darkness that are behind their human pawns. I said this on Wednesday, I'll say it again. If we have an attitude, you know, God, get those abortionists. Kill those communists. Kill those Democrats. Kill those Republicans. Kill those Muslims. We know not what spirit we are of. And we need to be rebuked and will be rebuked by Jesus as he rebuked James and John. You know not what spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save men's lives. We need to see things differently, and that's what the rabbis are talking about here. Thus, David passionately yearns to compose a new kind of song to the Lord in verse 9. Not a song about muscle and might, but a song of the pure and holy spirit released from the bonds of evil. This is powerful stuff. And then David says in verse 11, Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speak lies, whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Speak, rescue me, deliver me from the mouths of foreign foes, foreign oppressors, whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood. And we're back to slander and false prophecy. 
And then verses 12, 13, and 14, all of a sudden blessing is released on the people of God. May the sons, may our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Fourfold view of times of blessing among God's people, their sons and their daughters are blessed. They have enough food. Their flocks are fruitful, productive. What they set their hands to brings fruit. And there's peace in the streets. Societal peace. Societal harmony. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And then in the Psalm 145, and there I, I spent a lot of time on Psalm 145, probably about a half hour, and I, I don't have time to do it. I spent it on uh, on Wednesday night with our Bible study. But I want you to know, notice how the last Psalm of David, then we, we go from acknowledging the steadfast love of the Lord and worshiping and praising him in Psalm 138 to this intimacy and in prayer with God in Psalm 139 to remembered pain and deliverance from enemies in Psalm 140, 141, 142, 143, to this proper perspective of victory in battle in Psalm 144. And then Psalm 145 closes out the final Davidic Psalter, these these eight Psalms at the end of the Psalter attributed to David with even greater dimensions of praise greater dimensions of praise in Psalm 145. More terminology used uh, on how to praise and worship God in Psalm 145 than perhaps anywhere in the entire Psalter. Watch. The title alone, A Song of Praise of David. It's, you know, the, the Psalms in Hebrew are tehillim. Tehillah is a song of praise. The only individual psalm that is called a tehillah, a song of praise, is right here at the end of the Psalter. So it's a tehillah of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King. Bless your name forever and ever. I'm going to sing songs of praise. I'm going to extol you. Watch this, the, this just the incredible language. I'm going to bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And he uses different Hebrew terms for praise. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. He declares the greatness of the Lord. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Now it's it's commending the works of the Lord one to another. It's declaring the mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I'll meditate. Now we're going to meditate as well as praise the Lord They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and declare your greatness, his mightiness, his goodness, his greatness is declared. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness. Now we're pouring forth in in effulgence from our spirit these, these mighty declarations and we sing aloud of your righteousness. And of course, what is it that we're going to sing and praise? The theme that's run through all of Scripture but in so many times in the Psalms, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow in anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he made. They declare the name of the Lord. They declare who he is. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. Now it's Thanksgiving and it's not even, now it's not even just the people giving thanks. The works of the Lord are giving thanks. And all your saints shall, shall bless you. And, and three more times, uh, counting this one, three times after the final reference, the final reference to has said the steadfast love in what we consider the main Psalter, we'll, we'll see it one more time in the final five Psalms. But this is the final reference in the 
Psalms of David to his steadfast love took place there in 145.8. And now three times, remember, chesed is the steadfast love of the Lord, the Lord's faithfulness and love and kindness and graciousness to his people, love for his people. And then those who become immersed in his steadfast love, those who are the recipients of his steadfast love, the recipients of his chesed becomes his hasids, his hasidim, his chesed ones, his saints. And so this, this ultimate transformation from the righteous versus the wicked in Psalm 1 to now the saints, the chesed ones, those who are immersed, those who are the full recipients of the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness are now addressed. All your works shall give thanks to your Lord and all your chesed ones, your saints, shall bless you. And then the references to the kingship and the kingdom of the Lord. Verse 1 said, I will extol you, my God and king. And then we have the establishment of the kingdom here in verses 11, 12, and 13. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. The declaration of the book of Daniel, both by foreign kings and by the saints of the Most High. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Now that's in, in brackets in the ESV and it might be in a footnote in some years. It's a verse that's not here in Psalm 145. It's not in the Hebrew Masoretic text, but it's in the Greek text. It's in um, the Syriac text. And it is also in, um, they found it in the Dead Sea uh, scrolls. Uh, in the, the men of Qumran, when they had a copy of Psalm 145, this verse, the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works, is inserted, and I'll tell you why in a second, but let's finish. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Notice the praises go from just all the blessings coming to God's people. Now the entire earth receives the blessings of the Lord's hands. You open your hand, I repeat, verse 16, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Verse 17 says he is chesed in all his works and he transforms his people into his saints by being chesed in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Keep that in mind, where these psalms are headed. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. <clears throat> now, this psalm is an acrostic. Fi final psalm of the Davidic Psalter, it's an acrostic, which means Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and so on. Each line of the psalm begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the second line, the second letter, the third line, the third letter. It's Hebrew poetry and it speaks of divine order. So this whole thing speaks of divine order. Now, what's interesting about this psalm is that it skips the letter noon. All right, when you are, when, when it, it's going through the letters, when it gets to the verses on when it gets to the verses about the kingdom, verse 11, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. That's kaf. To make known to the children of man your mighty deeds. That's um, lamed. Uh, and then verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That's malak. 
Now, the next letter should be noon, which would be the verse between 13 and 14, because we jump from noon to uh, Samek in verse 14, and there's a missing letter. And that's why there was a Hebrew tradition, obviously, in the Septuagint, the Essenes, the men of Qumran, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they added a verse that began with the word nun. And that's why you have that verse in brackets between 13 and 14. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. And that would begin with the uh, the letter nun. But it's missing in the Hebrew. And it's missing in the Hebrew for several reasons. First of all, without that missing verse, with, with that verse removed, this psalm has 150 words in it. It's a summary of all the psalms. There are 150 uh, psalms uh, in the Psalter and Psalm 145, which concludes the Davidic portion of the Psalter, has 150 words in it. Obviously, if you add that missing verse, you break the 150 cycle. The other thing is... When, when you, there are different acrostics, uh, in the Psalms. There are different acrostics, uh, in, in, in the book, books of the prophets. The acrostics ex- exist as a form of Hebrew poetry throughout the Old Testament. But when you remove nun and you look back at the verses 11, 12, and 13 and you see kaf, lamed, Mem, and you see this missing space in the Masoretic text where there's no noon. You look back up and Malek, Lamed, Kaf, which are the three letters that would begin those three verses, it's the Hebrew word for kingship. This psalm ultimately celebrates the whole point of this of the Psalter, and that's that when we come into the kingship of the Lord. The Lord takes care of everything. This is the eschatological plan and eschatological purpose is to establish God's kingship in the earth. The Lord will bring us through obedience. He will bring us through suffering. He will bring us through hope. He will bring us through trust. He will do it because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness to his church. And he will establish his kingship and the church, the people of God, Israel, will praise, will give thanks to his name, will bless his name, will extol his name. His works will extol his wonders and the nations of the earth will see and they will follow. Now there's something very interesting. The, the, you can look at Psalm 145 and when Jesus' disciples in the Sermon on the Mount said, teach us how to pray, Jesus was using Psalm 145 as a model. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I will extol you, O God and King. I will bless your name forever. The whole idea of blessing, praising, giving thanks to his name. Our Father in heaven, let your name be made holy. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. There we go, verses 10, 11, 12, 13, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 15 says, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their bread in due season. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. This is a psalm about forgiveness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, Abounding in steadfast love, verse 8. The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. He forgives. Verse 14. The Lord upholds all who are falling down and raises up those who are bowed down. He forgives and he restores. The Lord is near to all who call on him, who call on him in truth. He forgives and he restores. He forgives He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. He preserves all who love him. He forgives. Jesus based the Lord's prayer on Psalm 145. 
And that, of course, brings us to the final five psalms, and we'll take a, a few minutes to try to summarize. I want to especially look at Psalm 149. won't be able to do justice to it, but I'll probably teach on Psalm 149 the next time I teach on our Wednesday night Bible study. But these final five psalms all begin with the word hallelujah, praise the Lord, and they all end with hallelujah, praise the Lord. Once the kingship of the Lord is established in the earth, Israel praises the Lord. The sons of Zion praise the Lord. The creation praises the Lord. The heavens praise the Lord. The nations praise the Lord. The earth praises the Lord. God's people and the nations that persecuted God's people praise the Lord. And see, you have you have five psalms and you have praise the Lord at the start and praise the Lord at the finish of each. See, the number 10 holds special consequences in Hebrew thought. The number 10 speaks of this totality of perfection. It means everything is covered by the number 10. Ordinal perfection is what we would call the number 10. You know, there are, there are 10 creative blessings in the creation story in Genesis, that begins in Genesis chapter 1. There are 10 commandments that we see. And we see this number 10 repeating over and over. God creates in series of 10s, and God also establishes his covenant with people in series of 10. And so we have this, and then even within the Psalms themselves, oftentimes there'll be 10 groups that praise the Lord in one of these final psalms. So we see this this praise the Lord that that just totally emerges in Psalms 146 through 150. And, you know, you see how 150, 150 closes, 150 closes out the Psalter. Look at it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with uh, sounding cymbals and praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, if you forget about the first praise the Lord, And the last praise the Lord, watch how many times. We praise him in his sanctuary, one. We praise him from in his mighty heavens, two. We praise him for his mighty deeds, three. We praise him according to his excellent greatness, four. We praise him with trumpet sound, five. We praise him with lute and harp, six. We praise him with tambourine and dance, seven. Eight, praise him with strings and pipe, nine. Praise him with sounding cymbals, ten. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Ten different aspects of praise. Sandwiched between the two praise the Lord's at the start and finish. And then a concluding praise that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Ten. But I want to take the last few minutes to really concentrate on Psalm 149. I will not do justice to it. That is okay. But let's let's take a look at Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. God is going to do something powerful. God is going to do something wonderful. God is going to do something new in the earth as all of creation brings itself from the obedience of Psalm 1, the messianic king of Psalm 2, all the way to Psalm 149 and 150, this worship and this praise of the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his saints. I said everything was going to get closed with three references to the saints, and we're going to see the saints here as the centerpiece of Psalm 149. Let his praise be in the assembly of his saints. Let Israel be glad in his maker, the one whose hand creates, 
the one whose hand redeems, the one whose hand restores from exile. See, he never stops being a creator God. See, we, again, New Testament redemptive theology, Old Testament creative theology. It's the theology of creation, the theology of redemption, but God never stops being a creator. The theology of redemption in which Jesus the Messiah comes forth in his Father's name to reveal the Father, to reveal the Father. Do you know all the names of the Lord that we see in the Old Testament? Yah, Yahweh, El, El Yon, El Shaddai, Elohim, Eloha, all these different names of the Lord that we see in the Old Testament. Do you know that God is called very few times Father? It's a hidden name in the Old Testament. And when Yah, the shortened form of Yahweh, which we see and the rabbis taught was about the hidden name of the Lord. When we ask ourselves, well, what is the hidden name of the Lord? Well, when we open the pages of the New Testament, it explodes at us. Father. I mean, if you look at the references to Father in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, it's incredible. Jesus addresses God as Father. It's the hidden name of the Lord. The church in Acts explodes with Father. The epistles, it's God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we get to the book of Revelation, it's the Father, it's the Son, it's the seven spirits before the throne, but it's Father. Let Israel be glad in his maker the creative, redeeming, restoring God is Father. See, Jesus is the one who has the name of the Lord in him. Yeshua means Yahweh delivers, or it might mean Yah delivers. Yeshua is the Lord is salvation. Jesus possesses all the names Yahweh, El, El Yon, El Shaddai. I mean, he, Jesus possesses all these names in himself, but the name that God reveals himself, the hidden name, becomes Father in the New Testament. It's all about relationships. Let the children of Zion, the sons of Zion, rejoice in their king. And the kingship of God establishes the, the creative authority of God and the kingship of God births sons and daughters, births father. Let them praise his name. And we might say at the end of this Psalter, let him praise the name of the father with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. You know, when Jesus was declared to be the son by the father in his baptism. This is the son of my love in whom my soul takes pleasure. This is the my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's this Hebrew word. It's the Greek word that corresponds with this Hebrew word. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. When we get to Psalm 149, when we get to the establishment of the kingdom of God and the kingship of God and the fatherhood of God in the earth, the Lord is greatly pleased with his people. He adorns the humble, the broken, the afflicted one, the poor, the needy. We don't need to be these mighty warrior kings. We're the broken, poor, afflicted, needy ones. Those are the ones that he adorns, he crowns, he manifests his glory to so that they become the priests and kings they were called to be, not because they're so, so priestly and kingly peoples, but because of his glory. He adorns the humble with salvation, with Yeshua. Now, when we, when we try to understand the Hebrew word for salvation, Yeshua, when we, when we try to understand that Hebrew word, again, I was 
looking at Hasfeld and Zenger's translation of this verse, they translated it here. He adorns the humble with his rescue and intervention. His intervening rescue. See, see this what is what does the Lord do to make his people saints? What does the Lord do to make his people disciples? What does the Lord do to anoint his people? What does the Lord do to make his people these mighty, awesome, five-fold ministers? He intervenes in their distress and rescues them. He brings them back from exile. He ransoms them from the slavery in Egypt. He speaks light into the darkness. He hovers, the Spirit of God hovers over the roaring, chaotic waters, and God speaks, light be, and light was. This is how he adorns who? The humble with salvation. Let the godly exalt in glory. We exalt, which means we 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 issue this this overwhelming, explosive praise that comes from us in the presence of his glory. It's his glory. Let the godly, let the, oh, what is it? Second time, the saints explode, have have this explosive praise in the midst of his glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. That's an interesting time to sing on your beds. It's not let us sing in the midst of the battle. It's more like let us sing when we're kind of hiding in our houses, in our beds at night, and hoping, as Pastor Jan said in Psalm 3 when she read, that our enemies don't get us when we go to sleep. Now, let's, let's make that image a, a, little, a little better than that. The Jews were told to recite the words of the Shema when they woke up in the morning, when they went to bed at night. They were told to sing praises when they arose in the morning and praises when they went to bed at night. They are called to declare as the day begins and as the day ends the words of the Torah. They're to read the Torah. They're to recite the Torah, the Word of God. And so this is a picture of the whole redemptive process of the Lord, that we're going to sing for joy in our beds at the end of day, because at the end of the day, the Lord will have established his kingship in the earth. Now, what is this explosive praise that comes forth in the midst of God's glory. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and let those high praises of God be like two-edged swords in their hands. How do we do warfare? Kill those Muslims. Let's kill those abortionists. Let's kill those people with sexual issues. Let's, let's kill those Democrats and Republicans. Get the sword out. I mean, in an hour where there are Christians saying that we need to take up arms like in the American Revolution against the tyrants in our government, what in heaven's name is the church saying? Let's read Psalm 149. The two-edged sword the sharp sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus when he's revealed in Revelation 1. In Isaiah 49, when the suffering servant is revealed and his word become like swords to the nations. It's the high praises of God. It's proclaiming God's grace and God's goodness. Let's keep going. And what do we do Verse 6, when the high praises of God take place and when the two-edged sword is in their hand, which is high praises and not a real sword, because the real sword of violence was in Goliath's hand and was removed from Goliath when Goliath was destroyed. 
back in Psalm 144. And what will we do? To execute retribution on the nations. Now, got to apologize to Teresa Vanderus. Teresa Vanderus has been saying, and, and I've been praying for retribution to come on the enemy. I'm like, no, it's restitution, Teresa. Retribution is uh, punishment. Restitution is, is, is wanting uh, people to replace what they've stolen from you. It's not retribution. And then the Lord said, oh, yes, it is. This says to execute retribution on the nation. Retribution is judgment that takes place because of injustice done, okay? Retribution, retributive justice, punishment, okay? And then the second thing that happens when the high praises go forth, we execute retribution on the nations and punishment on their peoples. This is restorative justice. The Hebrew word for punishment is it's educational retribution, educational just, justice that takes place. So retribution is taking place when the church gives praises unto the Lord, not when the church arms herself with literal guns and tanks and goes after the enemies of the Lord. That's, that's not God's purpose. God's purpose is to bring all the nations of the earth, all the nations of the earth in alignment with Yahweh. That's how the book of Revelation ends. The nations of the earth bring their glory and bring their praise and bring their worship into the Lord in the temple. This is the missional dimension of the church. We are rescued by the Lord and the nations watch God rescuing us. And as the nations see God rescuing his people, the nations turn to the Lord. There is retribution, but then there's correction, corrective justice. And what happens is their kings are bound with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. And in the ancient world, to be bound and chained when kings and nobles in nations were bound and chained. Yes, some nations took them out, marched them through the streets and executed them. But that terminology is also used to be bound and chained to the new government that was taking over, the government of his shalom, the government of his wisdom, the government of his peace, the government of his restoration. Read Zechariah 14. Read Isaiah of 40 through 66. God is going to bring the nations. He's going to bring the nations to Jerusalem to worship him. Read the book of Revelation, the nations. The Lord wants the gospel to go forth to the nations of the earth and wants, in the end, it doesn't matter what your eschatological uh, uh, understanding is. It's right there in the book of Revelation. If you're a post-millennialist, if you're a pre-millennialist, if you're an amillennialist, if you're a whatever millennialist, it's there. And it's all, it's everywhere in the Old Testament writings. They're going to bind those kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. And once again, to execute on them the written justice, the justice that scripture talks about. And justice, remember, righteousness has to do with right behavior. Justice has to do with right relationships. In the end, the Lord will bring his people into right relationship. He will bring the nations of the earth who will be converted. Go make disciples of all nations is the great commission. Those of the nations will come under the authority of Jesus Christ and will come up to Israel to execute on them the written justice, the justice that Scripture declares. Now, most translations read, this is the honor for all his saints. In other words, the saints will have the honor of doing this. But the Hebrew implies that, because it talks about glory here once again, this glory will be given to all his saints. And it's a re it refers back to the glory in verse 5. Let the godly exalt in glory. It's when the Lord 
reveals his glory. Psalm 149.9 ends, the glory of the Lord will reveal this to his saints and his saints will become the messengers of the kingdom. Now, just, just, gosh, we've got a couple minutes uh, before we close. Just, I've, I've gone too long as usual, but Let's let's look at a, a couple verses in Isaiah. Just just look look at how Isaiah frames this. Actually, you know where where I've been thinking. Where do we go from Psalms now that we're going to finish up our Jubilee year at the end of March? I'm thinking of doing Isaiah 40 through 66 because the language that you end up with in the fifth book of the Psalms, all it is is it's it's Isaiah 40 through 66. But we'll think about that. All right. Read, let's go to Isaiah 42. This is the first servant song. Behold my servant, Isaiah 42, 1, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I take pleasure in him, just like I take pleasure in my saints in Psalm 149. I have put my spirit on him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. The justice that is being spoken about in those final verses in Psalm 149. My servant, the suffering servant. David calls himself a servant in those final psalms of the Psalter. He will not cry out nor lift up his voice nor make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged. We cannot faint and we cannot be discouraged in this task. What are you not fainting from? What are you not being discouraged? The Lord's going to deliver us from exile. Hallelujah till he has established justice in the earth, the coastlands will wait for his laws. Thus says the God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth and what comes from it, all those that worship of heaven and earth in those final psalms, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nation. See, the purpose is not just for his own own people, Israel, God's people, but to for the mission to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I'm Yahweh. My glory I will give to no other, nor my praise to carve idols. Idolatry is going down when the Lord delivers his people. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. See, here's the new song. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. I sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fill it, the coastland and the inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice. Let the villages that Kedar inhabit, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise for the coastland. That's the first servant song. I deliver my people. The nations are going to see it and follow along. Second servant song, Isaiah 49, and we'll close with this. This is one of the six, uh, one of the five song, uh, words, one of the five words the Lord gave us when we planted Lord of the Harvest. And this was the, the verse that my mother prayed over me when I was a little child. I can remember being about four and five years old and my mother prayed this over me. This is personal for me. It's the second servant song. Isaiah 41, or Isaiah 49, 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. There's the high praises of God in the mouth of the saints in Psalm 149. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. All those issues of glory in Psalm 149. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. That's me every five hours. I'm given up. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. My justice is with God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be again, his servant, second servant song. Jesus is the ultimate servant, not David. 
not us. Jesus is the ultimate servant, but we become his servants when we wait on the Lord and trust in him and believe in him. To bring back Jacob to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. Yes, our purpose is to gather the church to the Lord, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. I'm adorned with a crown in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. But it's not just the people of God we're to bring back. Is it too light of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel? I will also make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And he closes in verse 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, exalt, O earth, break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted and the nations will see that and survive. May the word of the Lord come to pass in our midst in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.